Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Adam Wilbur. He's a keynote speaker, creativity expert, best-selling author, and workshop facilitator. Adam, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate you taking some time. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. You have an interesting background, and what you're doing, I think, is a really good take on... Well, we'll, we'll get into it. So... Before we get into all that stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. Yeah, I was born in Sundance, Wyoming. Okay. Um, I think the technical term is East Nowhere, USA, <laughs> um, and spent a little bit of time there and then spent the majority of my time from first grade on in Hanover, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth College is. Okay. So my dad, uh, my father ran the phone switch for Dartmouth College. and Interesting. I got to be brought up there, which was a great kind of... Uh, um, great place to be raised, a really great high school and great community. And then once after high school, I went to Burlington, Vermont okay. and uh, went to college out there and thought I was going to be a teacher. Okay. Spent about 15 years there and uh, sort of got bored with that. And, and just recently, about five or six years ago, moved to uh, back to New Hampshire, where I'm, I'm raising my kids and okay. um, kind of traveling across the country and world, performing and, and doing my keynotes. So this is a nice central hub with uh, my neighbors being moose instead of people, which is a nice thing for me. <laughs> Very cool, man. So walk me through, why did you want to go into education and become a teacher? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, combat the obesity epidemic in the world, or at okay. least the United States. And I thought if I could be a gym teacher, that would be my, my foot in the door to make a difference. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I, I loved the schooling of it, but then I had to do my shadowing, my, my student shadowing. and Right kind of got discouraged from some of the other teachers, the, uh, the ones that had been doing it. And it really just equates to you get an hour with these kids a day. And, and okay. if you're trying to teach them about healthy eating and healthy living, the reality is you have one hour to say your piece, and then they're going to go right back into the environment that they're being brought up in. So you're really kind of fighting. It's really about educating the parents more than the, the kids. I got and you. without sugarcoating it. Um, I started learning about what teacher salaries were as opposed to what the uh, student loans would be, and it just gotcha. didn't add up. So no. I changed my path. No, that makes a lot of sense. So walk me through, because you, you're you doing a ton of stuff. Walk me through what exactly you're doing now and how you got there, because you have quite the journey. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I was a drifter. I mean, the, the my real pitch is that creativity saved my life. And okay. It did. I, I was at about 30 years old. I'm almost 40 now. And um, uh, in my late 20s, early 30s, I made some really poor decisions that got me in some some legal issues that I just brought about myself. Okay. And I thought I was going nowhere except maybe potentially prison, really. Um, wow. And one one email that I wrote to a magic magazine, they had responded with something and their response really changed my outlook on everything. They said, hey, we appreciate you sending this trick in. It's a very creative approach to this trick. We love it. Okay. And that was about 30. That was the first time anybody that I had respected ha had said to me, you're creative. Interesting. And I'd never even thought of it. I never thought it was something that I could be. I thought it was something you were born with. And there are musicians and artists and poets, and they're all creative, but the other people just didn't get that gene. And then it really changed me. It, it really got me excited about this idea that I can take thoughts in my head and bring them to the world and better people's lives, specifically at that time, magicians. Sure. And I started inventing as much magic as I could. And uh, really, because I had no other option. I didn't know where my future was going. And, and I, you know, I think at the time I was a pool cleaner. I was cleaning pools for people. Okay. And just started inventing magic. And I got noticed by the largest magic company uh, in the world. Okay. And... So before we continue, at what age did you get into magic, or how did that come to be? Yeah, six years old. Okay. I got bit by the bug. They say, you don't get into magic, it gets into you. And a friend okay. showed me a trick, 
Okay. Uh, it fooled me. I learned it and showed my dad, and I knew I fooled my dad when I was six, and that wow. was the most powerful feeling I'd ever felt. Okay. Um, it changed changed the game for me. So you kept and it. I never looked back. So you kept up doing magic throughout your childhood and into your twenties, or did you? Or walk Absolutely. us through that? Okay. Yeah, I did it from six on. I was always okay. magic man. You know, I'd had girlfriends I dated for four years, and they never knew my real name. They just knew me as Magic Man. So it was always <laughs> what I was going for. It was sort of my thing. Um, I was the guy that did the magic. I was the class clown. I was the magic guy. But I never took it serious, or I was told my whole life, like, oh, that's cute and fun, but, you know, you got to focus on what you're going to do for a job, too. And okay. it was never even a, hey, you can do this for a living. I never knew to, known a magician that made a healthy living doing it. So it was just a, a hobby, something I was good at and that I did. Um, and then sending that, that article in to a magazine when they wrote back, Hey, this was creative. That's when I really started going, Hey, maybe I'll invent magic. And then, like I said, I got found by, um, the world's largest magic company. And that's when I really realized, Whoa, there's, there's potential to make a real living with this. So stuff, how did they find you? Magic. Well, I say they found me. I, I got noticed on purpose. So I just okay. got on their Facebook page, okay. started posting videos. They had a contest called Gold Wednesday for all okay. their, their customers or fans. Okay. And you would submit a video. And if you won, you got this special deck of cards. And I won like seven in a row. Wow. And finally, they wrote me and were like, dude, you need to stop entering because you're just you're way above everybody else. <laughs> so that was my very small foot in the door. And I answered that person and, and built a friendship and said, hey, you okay. know, this is what I do. Here's a few things. And it just sort of grew from that. Okay. So walk me through up until what you're doing today with your career highlights. Because you've done a ton of stuff. You've been on a ton of shows and a handful of other things. So do you want to walk us through what you're doing today? Sure, yeah. So... Uh, you know, I, I got in with the company at the very ground floor and then okay. I invented, I knew if I wanted to make a name where people would know who I was sure. and I could make this a real living, I have to do something epic, okay, something sure. that people can't ignore. Sure. And I, I really started, this is part of where my creative problem solving workshops and things kind of relate, Sure. which is, much so. I said, what's the biggest thing that I could do? What's the, the thing that everybody wants to be okay. in life? What's the one thing that everyone goes, yeah, of course I'd want to do that. To be a superhero, right? If you could genuinely sure. yep. say to somebody, I'm going to give you the abilities to be a superhero. And then I whittled that down to what was the one that I would gravitate towards the most, which okay. was fire. I've been mesmerized by fire since sure. I was a kid. And I thought if I could give people the ability to show their hands completely empty and shoot a fireball from their empty hands, I'd be onto something. Sure. And Sounds amazing. <laughs> that was the goal. That was the sort of like, if there were no rules, what would the, the end goal be? And that was it. Okay. So over cool. the course of about a year and a half, I worked on, I do some 3D printing and, okay. and some modeling and I started making things and I'd buy old things that were somewhat relatable and I would glue those to another piece of something else. And okay. I ended up making a prototype that I could then film and show the team at the company, Illusionist. Okay. And I remember I filmed this really rough, nasty video, but it worked. And I shot fireballs from my empty hands. Okay. And I think within 10 minutes, the entire team of uh, five or 10 had responded. I can't say what they responded because they were all pretty uh, uh, R-rated words, but gotcha. they all flipped out and loved it. And sure. right then I was like, this is it. Did you burn so yourself I, a bunch throughout the prototyping process? Uh, an immense amount, a, a plethora of burns that sure. littered my arm. Wow. I lit my smoke alarm off in my house probably, you know, five dozen times. Wow. Um, but that's the fun, right? That's the, sure. the fun okay. of the creative process. Got you. Um, but yeah, the main thing was everyone loved it. And sure. then there was the, the worry, the questions. How are we going to make this cost effective? How are we going to make right. this safe, practical? Right. And that's when the real creative thinking came in, which was, you know, what do we eliminate for problems? How do we solve them? And then put together something that will work. Sure. And it took about a year and a half and um, I ended up developing it and, and seeing it through from idea to fruition where Very it was cool. on the market with the packaging, everything. And it ended up not doing so well at okay. the start. And I was really nervous. Um, okay. This was my big push as my first project as this guy, this new guy at the company. Okay. And it was sort of, sort of making cricket noises. I mean, a few hundred had sold, but nothing to the point where, 
I was excited. It was a hundred and fifty dollar item. Okay. And I was starting to get. I had invested a lot of money of the owner's money, right? A gotcha. hundred thousand plus. Okay. And I remember having a conversation with my dad, saying, "I I don't know. It didn't work. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to market this or push it." Sure. And almost overnight after that call, it got it went viral. Um, oh wow! It started with Reddit. So some people on Reddit found it. Okay. And had made a comment on the trailer. Really, they were making fun of the trailer because it's this really overproduced trailer okay. that looked incredible. And they were like, who's this pot-bellied hipster walking through the desert shooting fireballs? But that negativity started upranking it in, Interesting. in Reddit. And even though it was negative talk, the coolness of the product spoke for itself. So sure. while people were talking negatively about it, they still were saying, wait a minute, is this real? Sure. And then other blogs picked it up. Maximum Magazine, Dude, I Want That, um, Touch of Modern. And then it just went massively viral. It ended up getting 1.7 million views on the trailer on YouTube wow. within the span of three months. Wow. Discovery Channel wanted to do a, sex- a segment on it. And it just, it, for a lack of a better word, it exploded into the mainstream. Sure. And quickly became one of the best-selling magic products of all time. Wow. Um, as far as grossing, how much it grossed. Congrats, man. So, That's huge. It was awesome. I mean, it, it really was sort of this uh, putting two years of something of my life into something and then feeling like it was a bust. And then almost overnight, it just became massively sure. successful. And, yeah. you know, so that was my sort of solidified purpose at that company. And then I just kept creating. I kept okay. setting challenges that were absolutely impossible. And I would literally say, what would the perfect effect be? Okay. For instance, I have one where I said, I want to be able to take somebody's headphone cord, have them think of a song with their headphones in, and just touch the metal tarp, the metal tip of their headphones okay. and be able to play whatever song they're thinking in their own headphones just by touching with my thumb and finger. Okay. Well, that's impossible. Well, sure. Another year and a half, I developed it. Wow. And it came out. It's called Decibel. And another one of the best-selling tricks on Illusionist. Um, so it really was about the freedom of just setting the most outlandish challenges possible and backwards engineering a way to bring them into life. Interesting. And it became... Uh, addicting. I, I, I loved this idea of inventing things that were impossible and figuring out a way to make them possible in a way that we could make money, that we could market, that were practical. And so for the last seven years, I've been with that company. Okay. I've invented, you know, 20 plus products. And wow. um, o- over the last two and a half years, um, I had written a book on creativity. A lot of magicians were asking, well, how do you how do you do this? Where's the creativity come from? So I wrote sure. uh, a book okay. um, called Creativity, the Magic Formula. And it's really just about my story. And the goal of the book is to, to let people know you are creative. And the best way to give back to this world when you're dead and gone is through creative endeavors. And it doesn't need to be a poem or a painting or a fireball shooter. Okay. A creative endeavor could be the way that you approach your conversations with people or your charity work. If you want really to, to live forever, creativity, in my mind, is the one thing that every individual has that nobody else can give this world. It's your personalized take on whatever the object or challenge ahead of you is. Sure. And to be able to own your creativity and have the confidence of giving that to people is really the quickest and easiest way to live your purpose, to live what your life's purpose is in a fulfilling way. So the book is really about that. It's about motivating and inspiring people to understand it's your duty to be creative to the people you love, your organization and and your community. And once you can figure that out and not be scared of it, it will change your life. So that's really what the book was about. It's got some practical applications on things you can do to be creative. It's got my story. It's got a bunch of stories on some of the most popular inventions in the world, like okay. Velcro and potato chips and how they came to be. Sure. And most of them were mistakes, were people playing, sure. going with one thing and then ending on something else. So I wrote that book and then I did a few keynote speeches on it. And I've obviously been on stage my whole life. Sure. So I I have a great stage presence, but I never realized I could incorporate my magic, my message and creativity to really help people and, and either in a personal realm or in a corporate realm to really say, hey, here's my story. This is what succeeded for me. And here's the way that you can apply that in your life. Sure. So once I did four or five keynotes, 
I pretty much knew the first keynote I did, I had two women come up after and they were crying because they said my message moved them so much. Very cool. And really at that moment, I went, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm supposed to be helping people learn to be creative, both in their company and in their personal life. And I've never, I really haven't looked back. I still worked with the um, magic company that I've worked at. Right. And, um, you know, I'm still there, but my real focus is, um, keynotes with workshops. So going in to inspire a company, talk about the importance of creativity, especially in the business world. Mm -hmm. And that word creativity for business can be really scary. Um, it's almost like, I don't want my staff being creative and going off to be a painter. We're really, you can say innovation without creativity. There is no innovation. Innovation is just a byproduct of creative thinking, you know, brought to fruition in some form. So, It's really the understanding of the businesses where they say, yes, I understand we have to be creative as a team to succeed in this world today. The ones that get it, it's a no-brainer. The ones that are scared of creativity or the word of it are usually the ones that are a little outdated and don't want to change things. And as you, I'm sure, know, in today's world, if you're not changing and evolving every single quarter, you're going to be out. So right now, my big passion is that, is sort of keynote. I do a keynote to sort of engage and inspire and get people to understand the importance of creativity. Sure. I mix magic in there and mind reading so they're you know, entertained and having fun. Then we usually take a little break and follow it right up with some sort of workshop. And there's okay. two workshops, really. Okay. There's, um, creative problem solving, which is really just how do you think more creatively about any challenge in life, business, or, or personal? How do you take these tools and think creatively? And there's a plethora of tools out there that you can use as a group or as an individual to get you out of roadblocks and get you thinking outside of the box and things of that nature. So that's a whole workshop to sort of develop a toolkit that you can use to creative problem solve whatever challenge you've got. And then the second workshop is really more of a refined challenge. So a company would have a specific challenge in mind and we go through a process called design thinking. Um, Have you ever heard of design thinking? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah, but for, so for people that systematic. don't know what it is, what is it exactly? You know, my take on design thinking is it's a systematic approach to coming up with prototypable solutions to a challenge at hand. Okay. So whatever challenge you've got, by the end of a design thinking procedure, we're going to come up with actionable prototypes that we can see all the errors of, which is a really great place to be in because you can quickly adapt and you may not, you might find the perfect solution the way you wanted it drawn out, but then seeing that solution is when you start realizing all the problems that might come along with it. Sure. Um, a lot of design thinking is UX, right? Um, yeah. The end goal of the customer. What is the customer experience? How do they, that's really more of sort of product development, things of that nature. But I love using design thinking really for any challenge and obstacle at hand. I use it specifically in a lot of the magic I create because right. it is an impossible challenge. And then going through the design thinking process, you really whittle it down to, well, these are the solutions that are going to work. Let's go through these. So design thinking for me, when I go into corporations and companies, the most part, which if you've done any workshops on it, you probably yep. can relate to, totally. yep. is really clarifying what the problem is. And, and the funny thing is they all go, oh, no, no, no. We know what the problem is. We want the answer. Yeah. So the first part of your workshop is really <laughs> the clarification of the problem, yeah. but they're responsible for it. I don't come in and say, here's your problem. As a group, we decide what the problem is. And I love that part of it because 90% of the time, that's when they realize, oh man, we all are looking at totally different problems because I see it from a logistics line point of view where you see it from a finance point of view. So it's that real clarification of the problem. And once you have that as the starting goal, then the rest is just fun. It's just a fun, interactive way to come up with solutions to the problem. But it's really about clarifying that problem and getting everybody on board, understanding while why the problem is different for each different yeah. group of uh, your organization. Well, and I think the key to that is getting individuals from the different verticals in the room to tell you exactly. and everybody else in the room their take on that problem, right? Because it, it's it's an interesting thing because just because the CEO thinks the problem is this, well, it could be that, but the the angle that the different employees and and managers or whoever look at it could be a 180 from that. Have you experienced that? Absolutely. Yeah, and and to be honest, one of the challenges I've faced um kind of to further that is there are some companies that don't want 
for instance, the last one I did, they refused to have the finance department talking about the issues they're facing because wow. they think that that's a little bit too confidential for some of the people in the room. Oh, um, and I had to, I had to turn that down. I just said, well, look at the challenge that you're facing is going to be impossible for us to, to do anything with, if not everything's on the table and this aspect of it, especially the financial is what you guys are saying is the main problem. So you either have to section this off where it's just finance doing their own. But if you can't get clear on a problem and you need to keep some of that insight away from the others, then it's just not going to work. That's not, yeah. that's not the way design thinking will work. And they appreciated it. And we ended up doing a creative problem solving workshop uh, besides the um, design thinking. But I have run into a lot of that. It's almost like a pecking order. Yeah. The, the people higher up the chain feel like, well, our problem is the most important. So that's the one we focus on first. And that's just you're not going to get to the conclusion you want to with that mentality. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. But I, I'm curious to know, when you get that kind of pushback, how do you convince them that they need to do this? Because I, I think, and, and maybe this is cliche to say, but I think Apple publicized the design thinking or brought it into the mainstream. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, they didn't. They brought it into the mainstream, exactly. Yeah, they, they didn't, didn't create they don't get credit it. credit for yeah. it or anything. Exactly. They made it popular because people listen when Apple talks. Yeah. Whether you love them or not, I, I think they were kind of the first company that was like, we're putting design first. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. But and how... Design and, and user experience. Yeah, okay. Right? I, the, I guess I see the them as kind of the same thing, but yes, I know what you mean. Sure. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of companies that just want the design to be practical, applicable, cost-effective, and they eliminate the end user. They just say, if yeah. we can make this product, users will buy it. You know, yeah. and that's, I, I've turned down, I mean, I, I say fired, really, but I, I've had to fire specific clients because okay. of that exact thing. Um, okay, and it's never easy. No one wants to turn money down. Sure. But really, successful people become successful because the work that they do adds value. Sure. And if me coming in and, and knowing, look, you're going to set me up to not be able to accomplish what the, what your objective is, right? I'm not going to take that because then it's just bad for my resume. It's bad for my work experience and it's, it's a waste of my time. So, um, normally it, it really is just about, I, I have some documentation that will really outline what design thinking is and why it's so important to have so many different people from every kind of Avenue of your company in that room. Yeah. Usually that will be enough for them to understand, okay. but more often than not, after the first phone call, after I send out my documentation, I'll know if we're going to be able to work together or not. Um, and it uh, unfortunately usually falls on an older gentleman. This is just my sort of avatar of, of the perfect client that, that makes this hard. Sure. There's an older gentleman between 60 and 80 years old sure. that is either the CEO, the CFO, or you know, vice president of sales that yeah. is a little bit too stubborn headed. Yeah. To understand that his problems or his groups of problems are not the most important, that it really is that team effort. And you get that after they get the documentation, they understand what I'm asking for, what we need. And within that first phone call, there's just so much kickback and pushback that, you know, I usually have to say something like, oh, I totally understand. It doesn't sound like the design thinking workshop is going to be what you guys are looking for as far as meeting your goals and objectives. Gotcha. And then I try and offer a creative problem solving workshop because that's no... That's really, it doesn't matter who's in the room. What we're offering is a way to think more creatively about whatever problems you're facing. Sure. So the, the old timers that are a little bit stubborn in that, yeah, okay. they're still looking for creativity. So that's the follow-up of them going, now that's what we want. That's perfect. Interesting. So, so walk us through a little bit of the creativity workshop without giving away, obviously, all the stuff that you guys kind of cover. But how do you approach creativity thinking and, and design thinking? Because I think part of the problem is is people are, let's say the people that are open to it, but they don't really know where to even start. Mm -hmm. Or what the benefit. The biggest exactly. thing is okay. I'm, I, they don't understand because it's not cheap. You know, I, yeah, I mean, okay. if I come in and yep. do a keynote and, and a workshop, you're looking at $10,000. Okay. And sure. for a corporation, that's, you know, they hire speakers at that all the time. Sure. But yeah. really, most of the time, they're hiring someone to motivate or to give a lot of information. It's very rare to get someone that can do both. Okay, interesting. So the pitch, the pitch is that this, I'm an entertainer first and foremost. Got you. So they want engagement. If you're hiring someone to come in to educate your staff, they want your staff engaged. Right. I, 
that's second nature to me. Sure. So my workshop for creative problem solving is about engagement, fun. So really it's about being memorable, meaningful, and engaging. Sure. And we teach them anywhere from 10 to 15. Sim- I'll give you a, a, a very common, simple example sure. that I thought, oh, everybody knows to do this. But okay. let's say we're working on a problem and we've just hit the roadblock. We're at the, we're at the writer's block point and nobody's getting anything fresh. It feels stagnant and we're stalling. Okay. You, we've got these, these flashcards and the flashcards have photographs of random objects on one side and words on the other. Okay. And they have nothing to do with each other. For instance, one might be a hundred balloons that are blown up. And on the back side of that, it says coffee in a word. Okay. 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 So you've got, you've got one person, you've got your challenge written out, whatever, whatever we're stuck at. Let's say it's figuring out a way to meet budget for quarter one of 2019. And uh, we just can't figure out anything else to cut or any other ways to, to fall that budget into place. Okay. So then we just pull these cards out. We know what our challenge is. And we're all stuck on this. How do we meet budget? But now we've pulled this balloon coffee card out. Okay. We pass it around the room and we all write down the first ideas that come into our mind that relate balloons, coffee, and our budget. Okay. And it's far-fetched and it's silly and it doesn't make any sense. But what it does do is force you to get outside of the box that you thought. So you're, you're stuck in this awkward box. And now we're forcing you to be silly, have fun, and play a little bit with these ideas. Interesting. We're not asking you to come up with a solution. Sure. We're just asking you to come up with something. Okay. And then we go through all of those post-it notes and we look at them. We talk about them. We analyze them. The next step would be going into asking what that challenge is. The challenge is us meeting budget. Well, what would we do if we were aliens from another planet looking at this challenge? Okay. Again, it's very silly. It's sure. very uh, far-fetched and illogical. But by the end of these two or three... We've got these far-fetched solutions, and now we're going to sit down as a team, and we're going to attach any solutions that have similarities. So Bill said if we were aliens, maybe we would um, buy balloons to fill the water bottles instead of using the uh, monthly bill that we have to pay for water. Again, silly and far-fetched. Sure. But now somebody else may say, well, coffee was on that side of the card, and aliens don't drink coffee, so we're just going to eliminate coffee from the the lunchroom. So now we're going to connect to the balloons and the water with the coffee. And we're going, great, now we've got something. Can we start cutting the budget in the office supplies? So it's just a way of really breaking the norm. And they say think outside of the box, but we're just forcing them to look at this problem in a fun, playful manner where we all sort of understand we probably won't come up with a solution by thinking about us as aliens. Sure. But it's going to at least get our thoughts to keep moving forward instead of us sitting here going, I don't know, we're stuck. And it's fun. It's a yeah. way to interact with your team in a fun manner. And as you know, creativity, the very first first starting point of creativity is play. Yeah. And if you're not going to be able to play, you can't create. Anyone who says, oh, I'm going to give you a creativity deadline, it's got to be done in two weeks, you just I, don't understand creativity. Yeah, you know? it's always weird, it's, right? Like, be creative 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And, oh, and I need it. I need it by the 15th at 9 p.m. Yeah. yeah. It just doesn't work that way. And And this is a way of... Um, forcing them to do that, yep. forcing them to be playful. And you, you're you going to get the, the skeptics and the people who don't get it, but that's sure. where sort of my entertainment background comes in. Throughout my workshops, I make sure they're seeing magic. They're engaged. They okay. understand this is about fun, having a good time. And once they can kind of wrap their head around the idea that fun and play is imperative in the work environment, then they start seeing the benefit of it. Sure. Um, so Again, and there's, you know, I work with a partner and we have a few hundred different techniques that we can use for any creative problem solving workshop. So we really kind of refine what they're looking for. And then we adapt um, some of the tools and games and stuff we would use to the specific company or challenge at hand. No, that makes a lot of sense. You're right. You brought up something that I've always found really kind of like you go to you go to a workshop or you go to a conference and you learn all this cool stuff. And then you get back into the office on Monday morning and none of it ever gets kind of actioned, right? Or very little of it. Exactly. But by your process and what you guys are doing, and if you get everybody in in the company involved, well, then everybody comes in on Monday morning and says, okay, like, let's get started. Because that's always been my struggle with going to a conference. It's like, well, sure, I learned all this new stuff, but the chances are... If I'm not the head of the company and actually can't Im- be the one that decides to implement all these changes, chances are they don't happen, right? 
where your approach exactly. is if you get everybody in the room from the different departments, well, then everybody just imp starts implementing it because everybody's on board, right? And and the exactly right. And the, the other sort of counter benefit of that is this stuff works, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. a way to most people just don't have creativity is not in my my field. I'm in I'm, I'm in finance. Okay. Oh, okay. I would love for a, a creative finance department, especially sure. at budget time, right? Yeah. So you're forcing them to see firsthand that, hey, we're having fun at work, but we're not doing it in a goofing around kind of way. We're doing it and there's actual objectives that are being met yeah. and solutions that are being, you know, fostered internally. This yeah. isn't us hiring some expert that says I'm a creative guru. Yeah. This is us hiring some guy that says, look, I'll show you how at least a group of magicians sit down have a great time and bring impossible into fruition sure. and your challenges aren't impossible. So let's yeah, do that. And once they see it working, they see that it's fun. You're always going to get a, a few people and, and at every workshop, there's one or two that just aren't going to have a good time. Okay. But that's probably just them in life. Sure. And you don't focus on them. You focus on the other 98% of the people that are understanding Hey, This is cool. We're getting somewhere with this. Yeah. Um, but I'm a firm believer in you can preach all you want, but until I see something work firsthand in front of me, sure. it's not going to sink in. We, we learn by seeing and doing. Yeah. And if we're doing all of this, they're not going to, to explain that and say, hey, I have some cards that have different things on both sides. It's like, oh, it's cute. You're never going to grasp it until you experience it, until you sit through it and go through it. And once you do, I've been most of my workshops, I'm hired back. Um, once in the first quarter and once at the, at the last quarter, because they get always new challenges are coming up and sure. they realize just having somebody there to facilitate us all coming up with ideas is of the utmost value. It's somebody outside of the company. Nobody has some quarrel against me or yeah, I'm not hierarchy than anyone else. I'm just some dude. I'm some yeah. guy who can help you guys facilitate the answers in a fun way. And when you get that system working, it becomes the norm, the, yeah. the creativity in these meetings become the norm. Well, we're stuck. What do we do? Well, we go through our creative problem solving, you yeah. know, or we go through better yet design thinking. Design thinking is a little, it's a hard sell, as I'm sure you know. It's, yep, it's a heady, so. it's a very heady topic. And, and the ones that understand it, they usually think they already understand it and they don't need any help. And the ones that don't understand it don't really care to understand it. You yeah, know? interesting. So, how do you bridge that gap, though, for people? I'll be honest. I, I start with a creative problem solving workshop. I okay. have them fall in love with that. And then gotcha. I push the design thinking. Got you. Yeah. No, that makes I mean, sense. My foot though. in the door. It's usually my process is usually, and, and this is, you know, this is over the last couple of years. Now my, my process is more direct, but it used to be book a, a magic show as okay. a corporate entertainer. Okay. Um, as I'm having dinner with the client or doing my research, I find out who they are a bit and then we start talking and they understand my other offerings and that gets me in the door for a keynote speech and a creative problem solving workshop gotcha. and then that branches into a, a design thinking workshop got gotcha. you but uh, but i think that's also really good advice how you leverage one thing for other upsell upselling yourself right or your services i, I think that makes a lot of sense right and we didn't cover you've got to prove yourself yeah oh totally but i also think we didn't cover this earlier and i think maybe it's a good time to cover this like You've done some really cool stuff on for some big networks. You've been on some shows. Do you want to maybe talk about some of that stuff as well? Sure. Yeah. So, so I'm lucky because I can get my foot in the door as a magician because I fooled Penn and Teller. They have yeah. a national TV show called Penn and Teller Fool Us. Yeah. Magicians come on. They show a trick. Penn and Teller get two guesses. They try and figure out the trick. Yeah. I fooled them badly. Um, it's got almost 9 million views. It's one of yeah. the most viewed performances on it. So well, that's Most people don't thing. fool them, though, right? Like, it's a very no. small percentage yeah. of people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Out of 100, there may be three that fool them. So that's the claim right there. I mean, fooled Penn sure. & Teller. That's great. But that works really well if I want to go do a corporate magic show. Okay. But for the CEO of a, a you know billion-dollar company to say, this guy fooled Penn & Teller. He's going to come in and do a creative problem solving workshop. There's a disconnect. It doesn't sure. really, it's still magician. So okay. I used, I've been on Penn and Teller Foolish. I've been on the discovery channel. I've been on sci-fi wizard wars. I've right. been on multiple TV appearances and um, lots of press and things um, outside just because of the inventions that I've made in the magic world. Sure. So I've leveraged that 
to be kind of the no brainer. If we're hiring a magician, of course, we'll hire this guy. Okay. Um, I've performed for presidents, all that, all of that is social proof that, yep, this guy would be a good entertainer. Okay. So now I'm leveraging that as my foot in the door. And then a lot of times it's just about showing them what you have. So when I get on stage, um, I don't want to sound arrogant, but the number one feedback I hear most of the time is you're very personable. Yeah, um, okay, you just sure. seem like somebody I want to have a beer with after the show, which is exactly what I'm going for. That's awesome. So now I've opened the door for a conversation. Sure. Hey, I would love to chat back with you. It was such a fun show. Just so you're aware, I love what your company stands for and what it does. After talking with some of your staff after my show, I really think that my keynote and workshops may be something that would benefit you guys. We've already built a rapport. Sure. If you have 10 minutes, I'd love to tell you about those. Sure. And then... I talk to them about that. And, and again, it's usually having to sell the creative problem solving because design thinking is such a heady term sure. for people. Yeah. Interesting. I know if I can get in and do my keynote and do my creative problem solving workshop, probably within six to eight months, they'll have me back with a design thinking workshop. So um, I've leveraged a lot of the press and my accolades and things that I've created into getting my, at least getting enough attention that they would hear me out, which is, as you know, in today's world is the hardest thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I've made some cool things. I, I made a lot of devices that shoot fireballs and that's pretty <laughs> attention getting. Yes. Very uh, much you so. Know, so I've even had a, a guy at a CEO who said, Oh my God, you're that dude. I saw that video, you know, so it went so viral that people know of it already. Very cool. So it's been, it's definitely been beneficial, but I'm really trying to figure out how to, how to make that connection, you know, okay, sure. you're a magician and an inventor and you've done all this, but why does that mean you're going to come help me and my company understand how to think more creatively? And that's where I'm really sort of tying it all together about, it really comes down to if you can create like yeah. a magician, then you can create anything because what we do, there is that word impossible yeah, is non-existent. You know, I say yeah. I want to shoot fireballs through my empty hands. Well, look here, I, I don't mean to bur burst the bubble, it's not really fireballs shooting out of my open, empty hand. There's okay. some sort of device making it work, right? Sure. So the, the, the goal being, and the thing I really push, especially in the design thinking is, for me, my, my end user, my customer is my spectator. And I know what I want them to experience. Just like Apple, they sure. know exactly what they want that iPhone user to experience when they open the box, when they take the plastic off, when they touch the device. Now, they have that as their set goal and they use whatever means possible to give that end experience. Sure. That's exactly what I'm doing as a magician. Yeah. I want people to think I'm shooting fireballs out of my bare hands and I'll do everything I can using all the tricks and stuff I know about being a magician to give them that experience. So you can do that with anything. It doesn't have to be really happening. You know, the, Apple may want them to think this is the best most high-end packaging you've ever experienced. That's why it just falls out of the box on its own. Well, you and I both know it's made in China and it's made for very inexpensive. It's just the yeah. end experience is what they're going for. And they use their tricks and all that stuff to get that end experience. And yep. that, that's across any challenge. Whatever the goal is, that's the experience you want to have happen. Well, so how do we get there? Well, I guess in kind of a magic term, like it's the illusion of it, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, and, and some people buy into it. And I'm, I own an iPhone and an Android phone, so like I've used Apple products for decades. I'm not bashing them. That's good marketing, really, is what it comes down to, or it's good problem solving. And that's what you're doing. So their initial goal is to you know, be the biggest, get a phone in every single person's hand. Nobody sure. has done any, anything even close to what Apple has done to monopolize a market like that. And yeah. While, while they didn't reach their goal, they sure as heck gave the illusion that every single person in the world owns an Apple phone. Totally. And that's why they're the biggest company in the world, right? It, it, yeah. It, let's take it back to the, the budget. Well, what's the end goal? We want to stick within the budget. Sure. Okay, what's the illusion? The illusion is that everything we're doing gets us to where we need to be, but sticks within that budget. There are ways to manipulate even that challenge. Sure. You can manipulate your budget. So it seems as if it's stuck in that. You can take things that are in your budget put them in a totally different bracket so they're out of that budget altogether. So you're giving the illusion that we stuck into the budget. It's just about how do we do it in a manner that gets everybody on board? And that can be the challenge. How do we do it so everybody's happy? And that's where you, ha you really have to work as a team and make sure that the people in the finance department are there with the people on the, 
Yeah, even in, sometimes even in the shipping room, you know, that's where the real, real magic happens when you get organizations that go, no, we're all in this together and we get it. We know what the end goal is and we'll get there by any means necessary. Yeah. Moral standing, of course, you know. Yeah, no, totally. But but it is an interesting approach to this because I think at the end of the day, the companies that are going to be around in the next few decades are the ones that take a creative approach and the design thinking approach to their business. That's my prediction. I, I think the most successful companies of, of today are companies that do those things. Who's fighting it out right now? Apple, Google, Amazon, Amazon. Microsoft. Yep, absolutely right. They're Uber. all Uber. Yeah, it, they're all companies that come across with creative problem solving approach slash design thinking they all are and they're they're also all very fast they fail fast right yes. they're okay yes. with failure and they're okay to go yep that didn't work quickly let's shift and adapt and boom go to the next actually and it's only going to get more and more in line with that i mean it's happened over the last 10 years but it's only going to be the only companies that are making any sort of progress are going to be the most creative companies and you'll see that get stronger and stronger and stronger to the point I mean, even Elon Musk thinks at some point we're not going to be paid like we're paid. We're going to yeah. be paid for our ideas. Sure. The, the people that actually make a living are going to be doing it because they have the best ideas, not because they know how to swing a hammer the best. And that's yeah. w with technology booming the way it is. That's only going to be more apparent as time sure. goes on. And there'll be a point. I'm, I'm laying the groundwork for my career within the next five years. It, it is going to be one of the most needed and sought after workshops keynotes is how do we get our company be, to be more creative? How do we get them to think more creatively? Sure. And every, I don't care what industry you're in. My, my guess is that in the next three to five years, that will be the number one focus. And right now, even the society of HR professionals, everyone who hires, there's three buckets they want them to fill in. Um, they want to be qualified. Sure. They want to be loyal and they want them to be creative. Yeah. And creativity ranks number one across the board. Everybody wants to hire somebody creative and the number one word on applications for the last five years has been, I'm a creative thinker. Interesting. Well, they don't have to prove they are. They know that that's what people want. Interesting. And I, I don't think you can be a successful company in the way that the world is today without being the most creative companies. And you can see the proofs of the pudding. Yeah. All the top companies, like you just named, yeah. every single one of them puts massive emphasis on creativity. Yeah. People wonder, why does Google let their, they let their staff play basketball and they do this? That's not so they can play. That's not so they can just yeah. goof off. It's so that they can be creative because they know the first step to creativity is allowing it, yeah. allowing your staff to do it, whether yeah. it's a, a good idea or a bad, and letting them play. And yeah. 3M, Google, Mike, you know, all, all the big ones, all the companies that are going to be here in the next 15 years, they understand that more than anybody. No, I 100% agree. So you brought up something that I was actually going to ask you about. Um, Failure and failing kind of fast because obviously you, as an inventor of any kind and when you're trying to push companies out of their creative zone and prototyping, you obviously fail all the time. You build a prototype. Something doesn't work. That's considered a failure, but it doesn't necessarily need to have the this negative context to it. You, you build prop prototype two and you fix the problems from prototype one. So how do you work with companies to kind of accept and, and work through those failures to become successful? And what's your thoughts on that? That's great. I, and I love that you brought that up because that's a massive part of my book, which is just showing, Hey, uh, m most amazing inventions are yeah. failures of yes. something else. And look at penicillin, right? Yeah. Penicillin was an accident. Yep. So it's, a, it's about giving, um, it stems from leadership, right? And, and first and foremost, that the entire company understands there is no failure. We just call them options or sure. plan okay. B. Interesting. So anytime something, one of my favorite inventions came from, I 3D printed something and the print came out massively mangled. Okay. I had some of the design files wrong. Because of that, it allowed me to put a coat hanger into this big gap that was, wasn't supposed to be there, and it completely revolutionized the product. It turned it into something awesome where it would have just been something neat. Interesting. And it was, the, it, it was really about the never throwing away an idea, right? Never sure. getting rid of it until we're done with this project because I can go back to it and go, well, what is this thing? Let me look at it. Let me play with it. How could I fix it? How could I better it? Um, 
and as far as teaching it into a company or an organization, it's a perfect example of everyone being there doing it together. Okay. So design thinking is the perfect example of that. You get all these prototyped answers at the end and people will shut down three or four of them. But in a really, you know, in a design thinking workshop, when you're just, everything's on fire and it's hitting and, and everything comes together perfectly. A lot of times those answers at the end that are the failures, you'll put off onto the left side or you'll put onto a purple post-it note or something. Sure. And then everyone will revisit them and your answer comes from those failures. Once yep. you get a company to do that once, they'll never ever look at something as a failure again. Every single idea then becomes, hey, remember when we did that design thinking workshop? Well, Bobby recommended this and we all thought it was a bad idea and that was the solution. It just brought us around a different way. Yeah, so for me, the way I've combated it is by making them see it, tangibly see it because they're doing it. Because if you try and teach it to them, how am I going to relate the idea that penicillin came to be the way it did if you're looking at a problem that has nothing to do with penicillin? Sure. It's hard to connect those dots. Um, so I do outline it. I do go over 25 different inventions that were specifically mistakes okay. that and Velcro was a mistake. Sure. Yeah. That wasn't supposed to be what it was. Well, it wasn't so, dynamite too. Um, dynamite was a complete mistake. Yeah. The filling, a, a filling for your tooth was a mistake. I mean, sure. most of the things we know of potato chips were a mistake. Yeah, interesting. They threw those away thinking, Oh my God, I screwed this up. This is never going to work. <laughs> and look, it was potato chips, man. You know? So wild, right? And most of the, I mean, everything I've invented has been an idea that then just got better through trial and error. And sure. I think once you can get somebody to recognize that in their realm, whatever their challenge is, then it just becomes second nature. But it's about that sort of letting them see it in real life, in real time, and then drawing attention back to it. Got you. Hey, remember we talked about this, that, and the other being failures. Well, look, we have an end solution now, but if we really think about it, it came from this, which we all considered a failure. That's why it's on the purple post-it. Yeah, interesting. So now they're, oh yeah, nothing's a failure. We can't throw away anything. The other nice thing about that, it gives people the courage to show any idea. It doesn't matter if it's silly or stupid. Sure. Because even those silly and stupid ideas, we're not throwing them away. We're just going to put them on this side and we might revisit them. Yeah. And it really allows for that, hey, I don't care. You're asking me to throw my ideas out. Here they are, silly or not. Because that's got to be a bit of a problem sometimes, right? Is people don't want to fail or, or suggest, quote unquote, stupid things in front of their coworkers, right? Like you got to break exactly down those right. barriers at the beginning, at least. Exactly right. I mean, one of my mentors said at the end of every week, he would go with 20 things that he thought would improve the business. He would go to his superior. Okay. Now, he was very high up in the company. Sure. But who cares if he wasn't? Every single week, he would go with 20 things. And... At the end of five years or something, you know, he was having a meeting with the guy and he says, you know why I like you? And he says, no, I, I don't. What is it? And he says, every single week you had something that you thought could better the company. You've been doing this for five years or so now. And I looked over these and over those five years, you gave me whatever it was, 1700 ideas, <laughs> handwritten ideas. Wow. And out of them, we use three of them. Sure. But one of those has saved us over $3 million. Wow. And I am more than happy to sit down and read through your ridiculous, silly <laughs> ideas sure. for that one. And that, that, I mean, kudos to the leadership of that company, because sure. a lot of times the leadership will go, I don't have time for this shit. Come yeah. on, man. But that's up to the company to then take the manager or somebody, some system in place that, that you should never, ever talk down or negatively about somebody for giving you an idea that they think can help the company. As far-fetched or stupid or silly as it is, there's a much better approach than shutting someone down, rolling yeah. your eyes, not taking it seriously, not following back up. You know, that's easy. Yeah. I don't want these ideas coming in. I just won't answer. Well, then, you know, unfortunately, probably in the next five or 10 years, you're not going to be, you at least yeah. won't be, you know, in the, in the runnings with the companies that are out there doing it. So I think it works twofold. I think it allows everyone to understand there are no bad, bad ideas. That obviously starts from the top down. Sure. But then it also allows them to see firsthand the things we thought were mistakes, we turned into the solutions to yeah. our problems. Well, and if they can... I don't know of another way to explain it where they can get sure. it without seeing it, you know? No, I 100% agree. And the other thing I think, too, that people forget about, sometimes maybe the idea is bad. Say, hypothetically, the idea is bad. But if it gets somebody else thinking about good idea or maybe another bad idea that sprouts somebody else's idea eventually that without all those ideas coming at the 
a room of people or the person, it might never have actually f came to fruition what the actual uh, solution to the problem was. It wouldn't right? have. You're exactly right. I think it goes back to writer's block. It's yeah, the exact same thing. What do they tell every writer? Well, you have writer block. What do you do? Just write. Sure. That's the solution for every single one. Just write. It doesn't matter if it's gibberish, if sure. it's nonsense, just start writing. Sure. It's the exact same idea with creativity. Just start creating. It doesn't matter if they're good, bad, whatever. Just start. Yeah. Just start the flow and then you're bouncing ideas back and forth. Like the, okay, you've got balloons and coffee on this card. Sure. That's not going to solve anything. What's it going to do? It's going to get you guys to stop sitting here going, we don't have an answer. I don't even know where to go. I have no idea. I mean, we're just stuck. We're stuck. It sure. gets you out of that and it gets you going, I don't care if, you know, we're going to save money by donating a bunch of balloons and buying a bunch of coffee. Sure. That's a terrible idea. Okay. What does it make you think of? <laughs> but that's exactly right. It gets you thinking, right? It gets you moving forward in one way or another. No, I, I think that's, that's really good. But we're coming to the end of the show. So maybe let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself, all the stuff we talked about today, your books and other content, because you have a bunch of free content online as well. Um, and so where can people get more information about you? Absolutely. Yeah. Just adamwilber.com. Uh, it's W I L B E R, not U R. So adamwilber.com. That's going to have everything from my corporate magic shows to my keynotes and workshops to where you can buy my books or also look at all of the magic products I've invented. So, um, you know, I, I took the track of not making multiple websites and just saying, this is here I am. This is what I do. So all of it is right there. The blog has a bunch of free content on creative thinking. And if anyone wants to message me directly, I do have a few books I hand out. One of them is called uh, 52 Ways to Get Unstuck, which are just questions that you can ask yourself when you're stuck on a problem. And a few other books, um, tips and tricks on creativity. You could just email me directly either from the website or info at adamwilber.com. Perfect, Adam. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future. <laughs>